open your Bibles this morning to the book of Mark, chapter 16. I think God's laid something on my heart this morning for us to look at that's, there's a lot of scriptures, we're not, I'm not going to make you turn to all of these passages of scriptures because there's, there's too many, but there's a, um, a comparison and a contrast that God's word gives us here as we look at this scene of the resurrection of Jesus Christ this morning. While we're going to start reading in, in Mark chapter 16, I want to set it up for you real quick. Like, This is the, the scene where the ladies early in the morning, Mary and Mary Magdalene and Salome and those different ones, um, Joanna, they have come to the grave early in the morning. It's still dark. They've brought some spices and they're going to the grave for the purpose of um, anointing the body of Jesus Christ is how the scripture reads it. And as they go, there's some discussion amongst them. We don't, we don't see exactly what it is, but we do see in God's Word that, that part of their discussion is their concern about the stone that is on the grave, the tomb, that is holding Jesus in and them out. There's a barrier between them and Jesus Christ. And it's that barrier that I want us to look at and compare and contrast with the theological stones in God's Word and how the stone is too great for us to roll away. But God is able to do all things and does do all things for us. Mark chapter 16, beginning in verse 1, the scripture reads, And when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and, Mar and Mary the mother of James and Salome had bought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. And very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came unto the sepulcher at the rising of the sun. And they said among themselves, Who shall roll us away the stone from the door of the sepulcher? That in particular is what I want us to look at this morning is, is this idea here that there's a stone in the door of the sepulcher, in the door of the tomb, and their discussion is who's going to roll away that, that stone for us? Who's going to roll away that tomb? Because the tomb serves as a barrier between them and their Lord, Jesus Christ. And I just want us to compare for just a moment some theological stones that occurred in Scripture and what the stone being rolled away represents for us how it undid or, or it contrasts those stones of old. And this is where I'm going to go through a lot of different things. I don't expect you to turn to all these passages of Scripture. I'm not even going to give them to you this morning as we go through it, but I want you to listen. There are six different stones that God has rolled away in rolling away that one stone that we might have access to Jesus Christ. The first one is, if you remember all the way back in the Garden of Eden, God had given a command to Adam and Eve and he says, of the tree that's in the, uh, of the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat of it, for in the day that you eat of it, thou shalt surely die. Adam and Eve, they ate of that fruit as the serpent came in and, and deceived them. And God is not a liar. On the day that they ate of that fruit, they, they died. There was a spiritual death that occurred on that particular day. And the day that you, surely, you eat of it, you shall surely die. There was an immediate separation. If you remember the close of chapter 2 in Genesis, it says that they were naked and unashamed, the man and the, and the woman. There was harmony and there was openness and there was transparency and there was peace and there was joy. And yet when Satan entered the picture and they ate, immediately they tried to hide themselves from the face of God. They, were they recognized their nakedness. They were ashamed of who they were. Those things occur because there was a spiritual death that occurred in Adam and Eve when they rebelled against God and ate of that fruit on that day that they ate of it. And in that spiritual death, brethren, there was nothing that Adam and Eve could do to deliver themselves from that condition of that spiritual death. That was as a great stone that we are not able to roll away. But we go all the way to the New Testament Scriptures and we see in Jesus Christ the, the life of Christ, the death of Christ, and the resurrection of Christ not only do we see the putting away of that spiritual death, but we see the new birth. And we only have the new birth because Jesus died on the cross and he rose that third day, which is what we're reading here in the book of Mark. And when he rose, he sent the Holy Spirit to us. When he ascended back into heaven, he sent the Holy Spirit to us that we might be quickened by, that, by the Holy Spirit. It says in the book of Ephesians, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. That death is talking about in Ephesians is the spiritual death that occurred in Adam and Eve. That stone that laid there that separated us from, from, from us having access to our Lord. 
But with, that, with Jesus Christ being raised from the dead and God having rolled that stone away, we now have access to Jesus Christ and we have the, the new birth, the spiritual life in us. God had told them, in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. And so there was a spiritual death, but there was also a physical death that occurred that day. Now Adam and Eve began to die physically. It was some years later before they physically died. But there was a physical death that occurred as well. The wages of sin is death. Death is required at the hand of sin. The wages of sin is death. And so Adam and Eve did indeed die a physical death in addition to that spiritual death. And all of us, there's a, a wage that sin. All of us, if, we, if the Lord tarries, we will all experience that day of physical death. Job says it this way, no man is discharged from that particular fight, from that particular battle. We all will face the day of death at some point. And the reason that physical death is there, it's because Adam and Eve sinned. That Adamic nature, the, the sinful nature that we have within us, the wages of that sin is death. But in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, there's a moving of that particular stone because we're not looking at, as a people of God, we're not looking at just death and then that's the end of it. Because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that physical death that occurred in Adam, we now have the... I guess I'll call it the bodily resurrection. That's the passage of Scripture. We now have life for all of eternity. Because of the work of Jesus Christ, because He raised Himself from the dead, He is the first fruit of the resurrection, and all of His people will be raised from the dead at that last day, in the final, the final destruction of this world, and the final judgment of this world. And so we're not looking at death. It says in the book of Corinthians, O death, where is, where is thy sting? There is no more sting of death. There is no more victory in death. Satan has been conquered, and it occurred whenever God rolled that stone away, a physical death that was placed on us because of sin, to where because of Jesus Christ's resurrection from the dead, we have that bodily resurrection. We don't understand what all things will look like beyond the grave for us, but we can know with an assurance. We can know with joy. We can know with, with a great peace and a lively hope that there is a bodily resurrection because Jesus Christ is the first of all those that are going to be raised from the dead. If we had not had the, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, if that stone had remained on that tomb and Jesus Christ was still in that tomb as a dead man's bones, then all we would have to look for is death and nothing beyond that. But that stone has been rolled away for us by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So we have spiritual death. We have physical death. And we have spiritual separation. If you remember, Adam and Eve were in the garden and they had fellowship with Jesus Christ. They walked in the coolness of the garden. They, they talked with God. There was intimacy in their relationship and their fellowship with Jesus Christ. And whenever sin entered the picture, that relationship, that fellowship with God was drastically changed. Adam and Eve were sent out of the, the Garden of Eden. They made their way out in the wilderness away from that Garden of Eden because of the costs of their sin. And so there was spiritual separation from the fellowship with God, and there is nothing that man could do to roll that stone away that was there as well. We could not bridge the gap between us and God and, and, and find again that spiritual fellowship with our God because the the, the cost of sin as well. But because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we have the intimacy and the fellowship with Christ today. Jesus says in John 15, I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me bears much fruit. And this is how we glorify the Father, when we bear much fruit. Why is it that we can abide in the vine, Jesus Christ? Because Jesus Christ raised from the dead. He rose from the dead. He sent the Holy Spirit that we might be renewed spiritually. That we might be able to have access to our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. That we might be able to be in fellowship, intimate, intimate fellowship with Jesus Christ. Think about it for just a second, brethren. There's moments in our lives where a great trial of our faith is occurring and we kneel down in prayer and we pray to Jesus Christ. We pray to God. And Jesus Christ hears our prayers and he speaks and he comforts and he embraces and he gives, he gives the, the, the knowledge of his presence with us. It's a moment of great intimacy. 
in times where we don't have any reason to have peace, and yet we have peace, a peace that passes all understanding. Those are moments of great intimacy with Jesus Christ. Times where we have great questions and, and confusion and struggle, and somehow someone decides to give us a word of encouragement and a scripture, and that scripture speaks directly to the question and the confusion we've been dealing with. That is intimacy with Jesus Christ. God knows what we have need of, and he's able to speak those things to us because of the intimacy of that fellowship. If it had not been for that stone being rolled away, Christ having raised from the dead, we would not have that level of intimacy with Christ. But praise God that we do. We've got that Adamic nature to us. This is the fourth one. We've got that Adamic nature to us. What that means is that we've got that sinful nature. Even though we have, have been born spiritually, even though we can know things that we ought, that, that's just good about Jesus Christ, in Galatians it says that spirit and that flesh, they are at war with each other. This Adamic nature that we walk around in, so that we don't do the things that we should be doing at times. We do the things that we should not be doing. We think with the wrong mind instead of thinking with the mind of Christ. We get caught up in our feelings rather than getting caught up in just the things that God's Word teaches us. Because that Adamic nature is there with us. It came from Adam and Eve, and there was nothing that we could do to deliver ourselves from that nature, the condition. But by the grace of God, we would only know that Adamic nature, the one that that wants to sin and wants to do what we want to do and follow our own hearts and do what's pleasing and right in our own eyes. But because Jesus rose from the dead, that stone was rolled away and he was not in that tomb, no longer do we have the Adamic nature, we have the Abrahamic nature to us. That by faith we might know and understand, that by faith we might walk and do the things that we do, that by faith we might have fellowship with Jesus Christ, that by faith we might be able to serve one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. It's by faith that we're able to walk as believers today. It is impossible to please God without faith. But by faith we do the things that God's Word has called us to do. And we're able to do those things that God's Word has called us to do. Because of the grace of God and the faith that we have in Jesus Christ. Where does your faith come from? Well, it starts with Jesus. Jesus is the author and finisher of your faith. And then the faith that God has given us, in Romans chapter 1 it says, from faith, the faith of God's word, to faith, the faith that's in our hearts and our minds, we can grow by. And as we grow in faith, as we grow stronger and stronger in faith, then we're able to understand how good it is that Jesus Christ rose from the dead and we've been delivered from that Adamic nature that we might be able to walk by faith in that Abrahamic covenant, and even better than that nowadays, the New Testament, walk in faith with Jesus Christ. And so we, we see that spiritual death where we've been delivered into a new birth. We see that physical death where we've been delivered by the bodily resurrection. We see that, that separation from God and the fellowship with Him to where we can have intimate fellowship with Him. We see that Adamic nature, the stone of the Adamic nature, being rolled away by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that we might be able to walk in faith. And we also see in that stone the unfruitful sacrifices of old. When God established the laws in the, book, in the, the first five books of the Word of God in Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers, He gave the instruction to the Jews to begin to offer sacrifices. The sacrifice, the purpose of the sacrifice was to make an atonement for ourselves or for themselves so that they can be atoned and have a restored fellowship with Jesus, with, with, the, with the Lord. And so every year they had to offer those sacrifices. Every, as often as they brought those sacrifices, they had to seek that out. There was never a time where the sacrifices came to an end for that nation until the coming of Jesus Christ. Amen. All of those sacrifices that the Jews did in the Old Testament Scriptures were unfruitful sacrifices in that it never delivered them back into the right condition and the right relationship and the right fellowship with God. It took one sacrifice to do that, a perfect sacrifice, a sufficient sacrifice, and that one sacrifice is all it will ever take. That sacrifice was Jesus Christ. And he died willingly on that cross at Calvary. He gave up the ghost at the end and he said, it is finished for this purpose. He did all the works that God sent him into this world to do. 
And when he gave up the ghost, that was the ultimate payment of the penalty of the sins, that stone that was there that separated us from God for, because of the sinful nature. When he died on the cross, he paid the penalty of that separation for us. But it didn't stay in that grave, brethren. Those ladies went to the tomb early that morning of the first day of the week, carrying with them spices that they had bought, sweet spices, with the intent that they might go and anoint the body of Jesus Christ. Peter and James and John and the other apostles were gathered together in a room somewhere, and they were weeping and they were mourning still that morning because they believed the body of Jesus Christ was in that tomb. And their biggest concern that morning as they were headed to the tomb was who's going to roll the stone away? Because the stone was a great stone, the Word of God says. Meaning it was too big for them to carry. They could not do it themselves. Nor can we. When we look at that Adamic nature, when we look at the rebellion, the rebellious nature that we have, when we look at the spiritual death and the physical death, there is nothing that we could ever do to roll that stone, that barrier away from us that existed there because of the fall of man and Adam and Eve. But when they got to that grave, when Mary and Mary Magdalene and Salome and Joanna got to that grave, guess what condition they found it in? It was empty. We know that you seek the Lord. He is not here. He is risen. The stone, God had sent an angel and God himself moved that stone away. Just like God himself in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, in his life, in his death, in his resurrection, God has removed the stones that we've looked at this morning away for us so that we might have spiritual life, so that we might have spiritual fellowship with Jesus Christ, so that we might have faith in Jesus Christ, so that we might understand and be able to believe in Jesus Christ. I think the last thing that was a great theological stone that separated from God because of our sinful nature was this. Every one of us in this room deserve eternal damnation. The best that we could offer before Christ, the best works that we could offer Him were as filthy rags. There's nothing that we could do and anything that we could offer that was pleasing in the sight of God. And so we deserve eternal damnation. But by the grace of God and the shed blood of Jesus Christ and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that is where we would still be bound. But because Jesus Christ rose from the day, from the grave, no longer are we deserving of eternal damnation, but we have eternal life. Life for all of eternity. That's the greatest stone that Jesus, that God rolled away for us in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's the stone that says what we deserve and that eternal hell is no longer the prescription of what God's given for us because in Jesus Christ, in His resurrection, we have the hope of life for all of eternity. God, Jesus Christ gave us, He came to give us life while we live here in this world, to give us abundant life while we live here in this world, and life with Him throughout all of eternity. We could not move that stone away, brethren. That stone of eternal damnation was not in our power. It was not in our ability. It was too great for us. There's nothing that we could do. If you really dig into it, we didn't even want to. There was nothing in us that desired to move that stone away. There was nothing in us that said it was worth anything. But God, in His goodness, gave Jesus the power to lay His life down and to take it up again. And when those ladies approached that tomb, that sepulcher, on that morning, the first day of the week, worried about the stone, when they arrived, they saw that the stone was rolled away already. God moved that stone for them, and God's moved those stones for us, that great stone for us. Well, go, go over with me to the book of Luke, chapter 24. I'm going to begin reading in verse 5. And as they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the earth, they said unto them, Why seek ye the living among the dead? Those ladies had come to the grave that morning thinking that they had 
They were going to anoint the body of Jesus Christ. James and Peter, whenever they ran, John and Peter, whenever they ran to the grave after um, Mary had given them a testimony of the Lord, they ran still thinking. They didn't believe. They ran thinking that they were going to find the body of Jesus Christ. These angels asked, why seek ye the living among the dead? That stone would not be rolled away for us if Jesus Christ were still dead. He is, in His resurrection, He is alive. In all of His life, He's given it out to us. We have life today because Jesus Christ is alive. We have spiritual life today because Jesus Christ is alive. We have life for all of eternity because Jesus is alive. Go back to verse 5. And as they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the earth, they said unto them, Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful man, and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. There was a stone for those people standing there. The stone was a lack of understanding. And it wasn't until after his resurrection that they even remembered the words of Jesus Christ. He had told them what was going to happen. He had told them he was going to suffer many things and he was going to die and he was going to be raised again on the third day. But they didn't remember because there's a barrier that exists between us and God. And if it wasn't for the grace of God, if it wasn't for the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we wouldn't understand either. But it was after his resurrection that they remembered his words and now his words begin to take shape. Now there's meaning and purpose to them. Go over to chapter, the same chapter, verse 46. In verse 46, the word reads, And said unto them, that's Jesus, Thus it is written, And thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. Now I encourage you to go and study out that promise of the Father there. I'm going to, I'm going to very simply put it this way. The promise of the Father is that he was going to send the Holy Spirit to us. And they stayed in Jerusalem until that day of Pentecost. And on the day of Pentecost, they were overshadowed and empowered with the Holy Spirit. And great miracles began to occur. But if you were to look at the first sermon that we see in the book of Acts chapter 2, whenever they were empowered with the Holy Spirit, when God fulfilled that promise in sending the Holy Spirit, Peter preaches, he preaches Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ crucified, and Jesus Christ raised from the dead. <coughs> It's the fullness of the story, brethren. If he had not raised from the dead, we would be miserable people. But our hope is full and fulfilled in Jesus Christ. It's not an empty hope that we might think that, well, I hope that it doesn't rain one day. It's a completed hope, a fulfilled hope, because Jesus Christ did indeed do all that the Father sent him here to do, even raising up his own life that third day. I found this, this is a, a psalm, but it's, it's a poem. And I want to read this to you just as you think about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It says, In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God and helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save. That would have been us if we'd been there. Till on that cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied, for every sin on him was laid. Here in the death of Christ I live. There in the ground his body lay, light of the world by darkness slain. Then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he arose again. And as he stands in victory, sin's curse has lost its grip on me, for I am his and he is mine. Bought with the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life. No fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. 
Here in the power of Christ I'll stand. The fullness of that power is demonstrated for us in his birth, to his resurrection, and even to this day, sitting at the right hand of the Father, reigning and ruling in his kingdom that he's prepared for us. And we're not quite sure what all of eternity will look like when we get there. But he'll be the reigning ruler of all of eternity as well. <coughs> Brethren, because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we can proclaim here in the power of Christ, I stand. May we all understand and rejoice that the resurrection of Jesus Christ, in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, God has rolled away the stone for us, the things that we could not do. They were worried that morning, who's going to roll away the stone for us? We don't have to worry about that anymore. God did it. God has done it. He's accomplished it for us in Jesus Christ. And so here in the power of Christ we stand. That's my prayer for Christ's sake, that you'll find that kind of comfort every day and that knowledge that Jesus Christ has paid it all for us and is our King and He is alive. He is risen and He is alive. Is my prayer for Christ's sake. When we walk with